All right, everyone. So good evening. My name is Katie Olding and I'm on the adult reference team here at the library. Uh, we thank you all for coming to another virtual edition of Art in the Library. Uh, but before I introduce this month's artist, the Library Foundation president, Francis Hauser, is here with us this evening and would like to say a few words. So Francis, I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to you. Okay, fine. Good evening, everyone. My job is to welcome you and usually it's to ask for donations. The foundation manages a portfolio for the library and we're happy to give about $50,000 a year from that portfolio to the library to um, help support programming. And I get to go around asking people for money. But you know, in the time of COVID, I don't like doing that. I don't like getting those requests coming to me every day. So um, I will say, if you feel you've got extra pennies in your pocket and want to send them somewhere, send them to the library. Other than that, we're so happy to have you here tonight. I had a chance to talk to Josh for a couple of minutes just prior to this, and I'm excited to hear about what he's going to tell us about his work. Thank you, Francis, and thank you to the Library Foundation for your continued support. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Josh Stein, who is a local Napa multi-mode creative artist. Uh, Josh has formal training in calligraphy, graphic design, and color work. He brings his influences of pop art, tattoo flash and lining techniques, abstract surrealism, and expressionism to his work. Tonight's presentation will include some photos of Josh's work in a setting that will look familiar to many of you uh, because they will show his work currently displayed in the library. Uh, Josh was gracious enough to move forward with installing his work this month, even considering the uncertainty of whether we would even reopen in August. But with that being said, we've also rescheduled his exhibition for November of 2021 with the hopes of being able to hold an in-person event. Uh, now at the end of the presentation, Josh will be able to answer any questions you may have. As questions come up, please use the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions. And we'll um, save these questions till the end of the presentation where Josh will provide his answers live. Uh, we're so grateful to have you here this evening with us, Josh. So without further ado, I will pass it on to you. Hi, everybody. And uh, greetings from, we're on location back at my house here in Napa. This is where I do all of my work and have done for years. Uh, I want to first start by saying thank you to uh, Rufuio, Katie, Sefnia, Arts in the Library program, Francis. Thank you for providing this opportunity. Um, it, from my perspective, when I was offered the opportunity to put art in the library, it doesn't matter to me as long as somebody sees that art, as long as we're able to um, continue on as humans, right? I mean, that's really kind of from my perspective, an artist, what matters the most here. I feel um, often that we, in times of crisis, we kind of forget about the arts, but the arts have been there for thousands of years for a reason. They provide us solace. They give us ways of um, thinking who we are as people, regardless of the circumstances that are around us. And so um, as I talk through probably about the first two thirds of this, uh, we, we're trying to use the technology to kind of meet the gap here. And so there's gonna be a slideshow playing of my work while I kind of talk through different ideas. Uh, and so hopefully that kind of puts you like you were there in the library while I'm talking. So if we can start that slideshow, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, I'll talk about my, is it up? Here we go. There we go. Uh, I, um, I'm not from California originally. I grew up in New Jersey. And in putting in my pitch for arts in public education, that's really where I got my first exposure to art. Uh, I'll talk more about this at the end, but I had real art classes, not kind of busy work, but real art classes from the time I was in first grade onwards with teachers who really cared that we learned and were able to express ourselves. And it was as much about technical correctness as the idea of being creative. And so I took a series of art classes. 
Um, equally, there is um, a community college in the Jersey County that I grew up that had a number of different summer courses with actual MFAs. And so I was exposed very really early on, by the time I was in second, maybe fourth grade, to printmaking, calligraphy, uh, color work, and color theory. Um, and again and again, what I have experienced is the idea that we can use art as a way of sort of looking at the world and talking about things beyond just um, physicality. I come from people who are uh, people who work with their hands. My father is a wood carver. He's here in Napa. He produces his own carving still. My great grandfather, I actually have the bookcase he made more than 100 years ago, is behind me here in my studio. So I come from people who, who work with their hands and uh, who are comfortable in trying to make things by and put them out into the world. Um, I got into uh, optical art when I went to college and I uh, was putting together a portfolio actually to go to art school for a variety of reasons I ended up becoming an English grad student instead of an art grad student uh, but so much of the work I have and for those who are interested in looking at it there my uh, Instagram has the 30-year portfolio of my work and so you can kind of see the evolution of my art over the years uh, it was at that point I got into doing um, uh, album designs, band logos, um, tattoo flash. I was in college, so I was not able to apprentice, unfortunately, but I was able to do flash, and a number of people are walking around the world today with my designs on their bodies, even though I was not the one who actually did the inking. It is what it is. Um, and so then I went to grad school. Uh, throughout that whole time, I was doing art in the background, but not in a serious kind of way, because as many people experience, there are other bills that have to get paid, other things that take our time and attention. I ended up in Napa, and that's where in working for wineries, I kind of came full circle back into graphic design, working on wine labels, working on brand identity, collateral, the kinds of things of commercial art, which are certainly part of what you're looking at here. Uh, much of the hard edge that I have applied to what I do certainly comes from that commercial background. Um, but in addition, what I've tried to do in the years since coming back to fine art is to kind of, how do we adapt printmaking um, without the printing, if you will? And I'll talk more about that. But a lot of what you're seeing is using a static structure that provides a certain level of uh, foundation to work within, what can we do in terms of looseness beyond that? And there's lots of different options, lots of different ways of working through that. Um, one of the things I like about optical art, there's a great deal of anxiety, I think, for people. It's a kind of anxiety and influence as regards figurative art. Um, we often judge people on how good a job they can do of sketching. Uh, can, you, can you do my portrait for me, please? And can you do it quickly? As if all that is in human life is the external or that what we would see what a photograph could capture. But one of the original things I was thinking about for this talk when I was gonna be physically in the room with people is pointing out how much of our lives are not external at all. It is internal emotions, it is thoughts, ideas. How much of your life do you actually express outwardly to other people? It's a real small fragment. And so I think that that anxiety of influence, that anxiety of figuration, of it having to be um, representational to the real in some fashion, it's very limiting. I think it keeps people back from appreciating art because they feel like if they don't get the picture, if they don't get the technique that was used, then somehow they're not an appreciator of art. And my perspective, of course, is we don't say that if we think about literature, that there's a spectrum of different ways of writing, a spectrum of different kinds of poetry. We talk about music. We encourage people to pick up and make their own and do their own. And I think that that part of what optical art encourages people because it is participatory. Um, I use metallics because it, there's, a, there's a real vibrancy when you're in the room with metallic acrylics. It's unlike a lot of other mediums. And uh, I was drawn to it. There's a, well, unfortunately today it may be difficult to do, but you can go to vineyards, which is where I spent a lot of my time in the wine business. You go to vineyards when there's no one around, when it's just you and nature. And there's a certain kind of light 
there's a certain way that the wind blows, there's a certain way that nature itself kind of surrounds you and envelops you. And metallics really allow me to kind of capture that. I say to people that I'm a wine country artist, but I'm other than one piece that happens to be here in this collection of 43 that are on the walls, there's not really much else that is truly kind of figurative in the sense of representation of wine country and the way people kind of visualize it. And that's quite on purpose because so much of it is interior. When you think about being at a vineyard or being out in nature, so much of it, yes, obviously there is what you're experiencing in the external senses, but it's also what you're taking in and remembering and how it changes you and who you are and the things that you think about and care about. And so I think metallics do that really well. They help to kind of showcase that. Equally, um, other than I think maybe three of these 43 pieces, almost all of this work is done using palette knives. And, Basking tape in various kind of ways. Uh, I have a number of different very specialized painters masking tapes that allows me to work layer on layer. Some of the mosaics that you're seeing there can have as many as a hundred different shapes, triangles, rectangles, whatever it is, per square foot. And there's a real layering that takes place to the point of, in some cases, as much as a quarter inch of paint off of the canvas. And so I have specialized ways, as I say, of kind of taking uh, printmaking where you would print through a form and adapting that onto canvas. And what makes that, I think, really interesting and through the use of the palette knives is there are a lot of options in terms of the edge control, the texturality, um, how much of a 3D effect there is optically, but also a 3D effect in terms of what's actually physically in front of you on the canvas. And I know many people don't want their work to be touched. I don't mind bridging that gap between 2D and 3D. I think that art should be appreciated in as many different sensory ways as possible. And so I think it's, again, it's sort of limiting to say uh, we should only appreciate things certain ways, but not open ourselves up to other ways of, of that appreciation. So some of the work is obviously very flat. Um, I, if you think about sort of having a bagel and taking a butter knife and smearing across that bagel with your choice of I don't know, cream cheese, butter, whatever, you can obviously leave that with texture or you can have a very fine smear. And so you can do that as one color. You can do that as multiple colors together. You can then add texture on top of that as well. And in combination then with the masking tape, it allows all different kinds of options. Uh, I do work that is more kind of geometric in the hard edge sense, which is typically more rectangles, squares, trapezoids, those kinds of things. Uh, I do stuff that's completely with curves. Uh, I talk about curves as heartache and heartbreak a lot because um, working with straight lines is working with straight lines. Working with curves is always a hope and a prayer that it comes out the way you'd like when you pull the masking off. You never know until you do. It's part of the evolutionary process of a piece where the piece is as much in control of what happens as I am. I'm sort of channeling what's taking place. And so the result of that is you have these different series of works that you're, you're looking at here. Some of them are mosaic works like the Falling Shard series, where you have falling rectangles or triangles or trapeziums that are in different kinds of combinations, some falling directly from top to bottom, some falling like a 3D effect, more like falling into the canvas, others with a spiral kind of effect, like you're building things out of those sort of glass shards. Other pieces are, as I say, more straight up mosaic, where it's the idea is to kind of layer on top. I have done a lot of tile work in my life, and so um, it's a, another way of kind of moving between 2D and 3D art and putting things together in a way that I think catches the eye and it forces the viewer to have to, you can't just look at it straight on. You have to sort of move around with it. The light moves, the piece forces you to kind of come to terms with it in a way. Um, and again, I think that that's part of not being portraiture, right? With portraiture, we, we see what it is, and then we start to admire kind of its technique in terms of, well, how has that been captured? And you can only go to a certain degree of that. There's a certain limitation of how much expressionism or impressionism you're allowed before you have sort of broken the bounds away from the figurative into the non-figurative. And again, I say in your memory, how crisp are those memories really? It's as much emotion, it's as much a sense of what was as any kind of true objective 
representationality. And so I try with these series instead to encourage people to think more, um, as we say, about emotion, about experiences of life, um, random straight thoughts. Um, one of the things that uh, certainly when I was a child, there was a gingham uh, fabric and I used to stare at it until my eyes would defocus. And then the fabric would start to cake on different sorts of shapes and would start to move. And I seek to recreate some of that with some of these pieces where it's not kind of like that 1990s um, computer generated, let your eyes defocus and a different picture will appear. It's more that there's a certain kind of synesthesia that is possible. And with non-acrylic, non-metallic acrylics, I don't find that as much. I can do the hard edge kind of work, but I find that the metallics really do kind of, they, there's a, a, a presencing, um, a sort of scintillation that is there caught under the light. And I think um, uh, we've done a pretty good job with these pictures and sort of showing um, kind of how that looks. Um, one of the things I was hoping to sort of show as we kind of come out of the um, slideshow perhaps is a, a demo of a couple of the kinds of things that I do with the pieces. Um, again, if we were in the library, I really wouldn't be able to do this because uh, it would be hard to kind of bring my studio to you. And so we thought that instead, um, this might be a way to sort of showcase how what you're looking at has been arrived at. And I'll we'll let the slideshow go for a couple more minutes and then we'll kind of come back to me in my studio. Ah, hi there again. So as I say, most of my work is done using palette knife or I call this a painting trowel. It's essentially a kind of palette knife but has more like of a diamond shape like a trowel would. And the idea is, I have a, a piece that I have prepared to kind of showcase this. It's just a small little four by four wood that I have already primed and it's ready to go. And you can see I've got this um, special kind of masking tape that lets me have very crisp edges. And I, I sometimes have to go back and um, I would say my, my key things are paint, obviously, the palette knives, and then just to put in the little pitch for Costco, Costco wet wipes. These things are the best thing in the world if you're an artist. Um, they truly, I go through several boxes of those a month and they are, they are the way to go. So anyhow, uh, most people I know that they often are into sort of making their own paint, making their own colors. I do some of that, as I say, particularly with some of that four element kind of thing where I'm adding texturizing on top of the shape that I'm about to do here, the paint gets smeared together in different kinds of ways. And so when I do a fire block, for example, it really does look fiery because the colors kind of bleed together in a way. Um, in this case, when we're doing just the straight up smearing, uh, I don't blend the, the mica that's in the, the paints. Doesn't, it doesn't really do well to kind of do other things to it. It works best just to kind of do it by itself. So I have a little bit of paint that's here on the palette knife. And then literally all I'm doing is smearing across the surface to cover it completely. And then the key thing, this is where the texture issue comes in, is to get it in a way that there's nothing there other than clean. And if you think about printing on a printing press, that's exactly what you do as you print down and pull up, or you print through several different forms and rotate through in order to say print onto a t-shirt or onto a piece of paper or something. I'm getting the same kind of effect, but I'm able to then, I can, I usually I do it while it's wet, I'm not going to do it now because we're live, but I would take this off. If I had to clean the edges, I could do so. and. I have a, then a heat gun, and within a minute or two, very carefully, if it gets too close, it'll boil, it's a whole other headache, I'm able to dry it fairly quickly and I can keep moving. And so that's how I'm able to do a, a 36 inch by 36 inch canvas and have hundreds of these going, and it doesn't take six months to do one piece, because obviously it would take a lot of time for these to dry on their own until I lock into using the heat gun, I used to have a lot more pieces going at once so that they could sort of dry on their own and I could rotate through. This is a much better way of doing this. And I could say it produces very clean and fine edges. I thought as well, I would give an example of how to do curves because I think people get the idea with geometric work 
that it only is sort of straight edges kinds of things. And I have here a piece, this is another one that I'm doing. You can see the iridescence really do kind of move in the light, I think you can see that. And so there, I already did several layers and I have now masking tape circles that I already used once. And so there's a circle underneath there. I then have very thin masking tape that I very carefully wrap around the edge and then put masking tape around that so that it's a fully sealed. And what I will get when I do this in a second is just that crescent will become the color that I'm putting in. And again, in the same way, I can take it off then, let it dry and then take it off. And what I have is those very crisp kind of shapes that you were seeing on the slideshow. So again, I'll just do that real quick just to show that we're live and I really can do these things. Paint. And it's figuring out how to do this without driving myself nuts. Yes, my hair is gray, but without driving myself nuts, um, that's why I say curves are heartaches and heartbreaks. That's several years of doing lots and lots. I do a piece every three days on average, large pieces. So lots and lots of curves. And I can do it quick now, I promise you, when I started, when I came back to fine art, I could not. And that's kind of part of what I want to talk about as I'm kind of coming to a close here with the overall, what I'm talking about. Um, there's, a, there's a big issue, right? Of like, like, what's good art? What's great art? And for me, I think here's how I would kind of clearly explain the difference. Good art may be really technically brilliant. I may be impressed by what someone has put together. But if it doesn't then move me to do something next, Right? Not that I necessarily have to then pick up the typewriter or the keyboard, the paint, the notepad, whatever my response is, but there should be a response. It should make me want to go beyond just looking at it and then going, okay, what is next? Right? And I think that particularly in our world today, whether we're talking about optical art or not, there's a real tendency for artwork to end up becoming kind of more like, like wallpaper. It just becomes part of the background. As, a part of, as opposed to being part of our lives and really helping to sort of talk to us and help us to frame how we are and who we are in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I put art on the walls of the library, whether people were gonna be able to see it or not, because people still work in the library and they're looking at bare walls. And who wants to come to bare walls? I don't wanna live that way. I don't want other people to live. And so to me, if we're talking about what constitutes great art, Great art is that which inspires other people to do something. And for me, this piece, this talk, this show, it's, it's dedicated to my very first art teacher, Mr. Viscardi, who is long dead now, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. V, who started off with an art cart before he was able to convince them to give him the janitor's room to turn it into the art room. And it was in Mr. V's room that I learned not just that I had the ability to make art, but that I could work with other people. He allowed us to create gangs of kids who when they got done with their projects, helped other people to create their own. And so I remember working on and creating a project that took up and used the time and effort and the creative energies of at least 10 or 12 kids. And this went on for weeks and weeks. That is the greatest artist I ever knew. And I was in first and second grade. I never saw his art. I never saw a single piece that the man produced. But if great art, if the idea of being a great artist is to inspire other people to make and do and show their humanity, that is a great artist. So that's the past. And in the same kind of way, the, this is also dedicated to my children who are artists themselves, who are equally have been, um, who have been sort of have asked from the very beginning, Make your art. Don't make what we want you to make. Make what you want to make. And that really, I think, is kind of what the, the lesson should be for everybody, particularly in times like now. You should pick up. You should do and not wish afterwards that you had done. I have done many things in my life. I have been a professor. I have, I have owned wineries. They have come and gone. Things come and go. It is better to try than to have to live with the regrets of not trying. And so I think that that really, my art is testament to that idea that as long as there is still breath, as long as there still is humanity, then there still is the ability to express that to other people and hopefully catch their interest. 
And it's not so much whether or not someone likes my art or not. It truly isn't. That's not why I wanted to do this talk. It hasn't been the focus of what I've been trying to say. It is more what we can give to others, right? It is the interconnectedness of us as people. That is what sees us through the hard times. That is why art has been here with us. And putting in my little pitch for optical art, go all the way back to the earliest cave drawings and cave paintings. Many of them were in fact not figurative, but were actually by blowing through your hand onto the cave and giving you not the figurative of someone's hand, but what remains after their hand is gone. That is what optical art allows us. That's my pitch for my work, and I hope it has been an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Josh. I always have a hard time going into Q&A because I'm still thinking so much about what you just said. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and um, use the Q&A function at the bottom, and then I'll read off those questions uh, to Josh. And if you want to share your video, just uh, either chat and tell me you want to do that or raise your hand and we'll make that happen. Okay, Q&A number one <laughs> from Carleen. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. And let's share Carleen's video. Let's see. I'm going to try to do that. Let's see if I can do that. I, think I have Carleen. I think I have you able to talk, Carleen. Can we hear you? Okay. Can you hear me, Josh? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Oh, there um, you are. There I am. There I am. <laughs> hey, this is a side of you I didn't know. Wow. And it's really cool. Thank you so <clears throat> much. Josh and I are our colleagues at Napa Valley College. And uh, I wanted to be here to see your work. And um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, and if Francis or Katie have questions too, please chime in. I wanted to ask you who some of your influences have been. Now, I am not a, you know, I know some art, but I don't know like you do. But I'm seeing a little bit of, when you talk about uh, textures and things like that, I'm seeing a little bit of Escher. I'm seeing a little bit of, Rauschenberg. I'm seeing a little bit of uh, Paul Clay. Am I saying that name right? Clay, yes. Yeah. Uh, Clay. Um, and um, I really, I really liked a lot of it. I mean, some of it, you know, would just pop at me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm wondering too, okay, what are some of your, in who are some of your influences? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think you're right with Escher. Um, certainly, if you're talking about optical art, you know, there's this, like you say, up until the late 19th century, it's always about figurative art, right? And even when you get to expressionism and impressionism, it's how do I convey my emotion? How do I convey the feeling of the moment, but still in a figurative fashion? And, you know, about 1910 or so, there's this like change that takes place. And I think uh, certainly, you know, I did a lot, of, I've done a lot of illustration that certainly when I first came back to fine art, and this is something I would say to many people, I literally locked myself away. I didn't look at any social media, I didn't look at any art, I didn't do anything for almost two years other than simply draw so that I could sort of, I, and I started where I had sort of left off a number of years ago before I was doing the commercial art. And I very quickly found that I had to, I had to do a different direction. I wasn't that person anymore. So the kind of art I was doing wasn't the same, but certainly what has been a throughput throughout my life um, because of the reliance on calligraphy, because of learning very early on pen and uh, pencil skills. Uh, I mean, Escher, he, his work is, um, is, it's a very interesting shift that happens. And it, it is precisely that awareness, that movement away from 
having to be um, literal to the outside and moving more towards the interiority into the, um, the meta, if you will, where art becomes about art itself. And I actually have his two hands drawing each other. I have that as a tattoo mm. on, on me, um, precisely because I, I, I don't like those sort of limitations. Um, people like Rauschenberg, people like the pop artists, uh, I, I, even up until the 80s and the 90s, um, there are, once you shift to street art, that's really where I came from, right? Not as a street artist, but what I was surrounded by and what I, that's what I knew. It's, uh, this is what artists did. That was, I remember looking at um, Basquiat at 10 and 11 and like, well, isn't that what you were supposed to do? You have thoughts, you put them on the wall and hopefully they make sense to other people. So I think um, my influence, if you will, I'm an Americanist by training, right? And so I've been exposed to a lot of different ideas um, both visually and in, and in writing in terms of different ways of playing with people's heads. And if there's anything that's a kind of throughput continuity to what I do, that really is. I don't want any of my pieces to be on the wall and to be ignored. You might not like it, but I don't want it to be something that you were able to walk past. And I don't want it to be something that you don't like in a way that's offensive, right? I mean, that's, that's part of pop art, part of agitprop is like different ways of kind of poking at people. And I do some of that work myself, particularly for political causes and things that I support. But in general, I want my art to sort of be able to occupy space in a way that um, is kind of like illustration, but is also more like sculpture. That's kind of the best way to talk about it. And the texturizing um, of someone, let's say like a Rauschenberg, is a, um, it's a flat kind of texturizing. It is not coming off of the canvas in the same kind of yeah, way. Yeah, like he does. Yeah. And, and so, like I say, some of my pieces, there goes my light. Some of my pieces, um, <laughs> right, I'm just going to kill it now so we don't have to smoke. Some, some of my pieces, um, as I say, I don't, I, because of the, uh, the metallics, I don't do a lot of additives. I don't use a lot of things that you can do with the more matte kind of acrylics. So I can't, you, you can get stuff that's like really like texture. And you can, there are some people that do like six and eight inches off the canvas and it really kind of pops out. It's very difficult to do that with the metallics. And so that's kind of where I draw the line. I'm still, I, that is one of the things I'm always sort of working with is how much off of the canvas I can come, how much more like a sculptor I can make the piece. Well, I was wondering too, if the metallic paint, and I would think so, is an entirely different type of paint to try to work with. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, when we draw with uh, acrylics in general, you have sort of soft and then sort of liquid and stuff. That I think for people that are non-artists, the best way to kind of think about this is you have stuff that's more like mayonnaise, stuff that's kind of more like uh, slightly warm butter and stuff that can be like really liquidy and all the way to like purely um, an acrylic that is almost like an alcohol-based ink that is very runny. Mm -hmm. um, use it using it, you know, to do spray stuff on, on cars and things or on models. Like there's all, there's a whole range there. The metallics, again, because there's a physicality to it, it's a, there's an actual mica, right? It, 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 so there's not, it, there's limitations in terms of the way the product can be put together. But I find it, it's really interesting because um, regardless of the, and the reason the palette knives became so important, the final schmear, with metallics is what matters altogether. If everything can be perfect in terms of even layers, but if you've put the final layer on and it has more of a noir kind of effect to it, the light goes off in different directions because the mic is catching different light. Mm. And so it looks very different. And so in a piece like the four elements or a piece like what you're seeing behind me here, the goal there with the texturizing is to kind of work in a very different way, precisely because I actually got into that because I was working with these larger pieces and I couldn't get the finish perfect. I have some very large palette knives. That is a very large palette knife, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I work with all kinds of tools, um, my texturizing tools, stuff that I have repurposed. Believe it or not, um, me and cake makers have the most in common because palette knives are palette knives whether you're working with frosting or you're working with paint, right? And so a lot of that's the same. Um, the cakes have a finite size, 
this is about the finite size of the cake that they work with and they spin it, right? And it's, it comes out all perfect. I can't do that for a piece that's four feet long sometimes. And so that's where the texturizing comes in as a way to still have the, um, the structure, the order, and still create chaos, if you will, inside of that, whatever that particular box is that I'm working with that particular mm -hmm. box. Yeah, Josh, um, yeah. we have another question from Jonathan, um, who said, where do you see the role of art going in this COVID world where people are very isolated? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I have um, multiple exhibitions going on right now, and they're all virtual, right? I mean, it's, and some are, are using like apps and software that you pull up and you can like sort of physically like you're walking through. And I thought our pictures were just as good in that sense because I think in a certain sense, we've grown up with photography. And so we're kind of used to seeing those, those pictures. In terms of, I think, um, I think actually artists are not making enough use of what is available to them. I have seen, um, I, I say typically with like my Instagram account, I post works in progress every day. I use it as a way of forcing me to keep doing work. It's real easy as an artist to say, oh, I'm going to do it. But it doesn't get done unless you actually, you know, go and do it. And so that's how I'm able to say I produce eight to 10 pieces a month because I'm like making that work go. But part of what makes that go is that I feel like I have this obligation to whatever audience I've got, right? I'm not, I'm not huge. Believe me, I'm in Napa. No one cares about me. But... <laughs> But like, I feel like I should post every day, right? I don't want to post like just a post. I want to post because it's real true updates to the work that I'm doing. And so I feel like um, it's like what we're doing here. I can talk with people and show my work at the same time. In a certain sense, there's probably people who have seen this work now who have no ability to come to Napa to see it precisely because they're able to access this online. So I, I guess I, I think from my perspective, um, certainly in my own life, art has always been a salvation. Art has been a way of reaffirming um, that I am here, that I'm real, that whatever the situation is, is not the be all and end all, that tomorrow will be a new day, that this too shall pass. And it's art that often gives that to us. Uh, and so I, I, I mean, certainly what I am trying to do is to put as much of my art out there as I can in as many different ways as I possibly can, right? And I mean, why do an artist talk where you show your techniques? It's not about my techniques. Like, take them, go, make your own work. That's kind of the point, is I think that art can be used as a way of connecting people. And if we are physically isolated, so what? We're mostly physically isolated anyway. I live in Napa. I've been back to New Jersey in a quarter century, right? I mean, I can be and connect with those people virtually in a way that I can't physically. So I, I, I guess my, my general philosophy for art and for how I try to live is you make the best of what you got. If you, what you have is in you. Really. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Feel free to enter them in the Q and A or the chat. In the meantime, I actually have a question. <laughs> um, metallic inks, how do those differ from acrylics? So, um, when I do uh, metallic illustrations, those take, oh my goodness, about 18 times as long. There's, kind of, there's one you can kind of see in the back corner there. It's a very large 36 by 38 inch piece um, that was done with metallic inks. And there it's even worse because you still have the mica. I'm not worse than like bad, worse in terms of the final finish. You still have the mica. So there's still a, something that you're physically using to catch and refract the light. Right? And with iridescence, you actually have multiple layers there. So it's catching different kinds of light. With metallic ink, then, you have to very painstakingly, while the ink is still wet, go back and reline. And so what would take 10 seconds at best with a palette knife can take 10 minutes for the same two inch square. And so that's really one of the reasons I moved away from illustration back into painting. I hadn't painted for many years, but I found the metallic inks were just simply taking too long. In 18 months, I produced less than 60 metallic illustrations. And some of those were very large pieces, right? So that takes a fair amount of time regardless. But I just couldn't, my desire to come up with something new. And I, I don't, I'm not one of those people who wants to start it and let it then just sort of drift. I, I, I have a, I, um, 
an Excel spreadsheet that I, I force myself. Everyone gets a number. Everything gets a name. If you start it, then you finish it. Precisely because I wanted to kind of keep moving it forwards. And the metallic inks, they're fun. They look really great. They really pop in a way that other kinds of inks don't. But they are just so labor intensive. Thank you. Okay, so no more questions. Did you, anything else you want to add, Josh? Um, again, I, I thank everyone for their time, and uh, hopefully it was a way of spending a bit of your Friday evening that is better than just looking at reruns or hoping for something else to show up on Netflix. <laughs> um, please uh, also go to my website, steincreates.com. My Instagram is also instagram.com slash steincreates. You just Google Josh Stein art, you'll, you'll find plenty of my pieces out there because I'm up on a number of the different sort of online sales platforms and those kinds of things. Um, as I say, to me, the, the thing I would sort of suggest to anyone who is sort of paying attention here is it's not really about me. Pick up a pen, pick up a brush or go do something, build something, make something. We each only have 168 hours in the week. We can choose to spend that time a lot of different ways. What I can say is I don't regret the time I've spent in making art over the years. There's something that's there at the end of that time that I'm able to then share and give to others. That that time doesn't feel wasted in a way that just sort of staring at a screen often can. Well, I want to thank Josh for sharing your story and giving us a preview of your work. Um, we're also very excited that we'll be able to hopefully see your work in person next year, but we'll give it a, another try. Um, and we're just so grateful that you've joined us here virtually this evening. Um, we also want to thank everyone who came this evening. It was really great and your questions were wonderful. Our next virtual event will be Remarkable Journeys, which is next Thursday, August 20th at 7 o'clock. And Jeffrey Hansen will talk about his travel adventures to Death Valley. So thank you, Josh Stein. Thank you for everyone who came. We hope you all stay safe and healthy and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.